Okay, so Philippians 1, 1 and 2. Now, um, we know, I am I'm sure, that one of the most controversial of all issues in the world today, an issue where uh, the Christian worldview is clearly at odds with society, is the topic of a person's identity. Would you not agree with me that that's a real battleground? You know, we're on the front lines when we begin to think about identity. With the present views on, on sex, or certainly when it comes to ideas about gender, um, then we found with these things, there's been heated debate, not just debate, but heated de- debate about how a person should think of themselves, how they should view themselves. There has been debate about what stands right at the heart of identity. There's a real controversial and topical issue. Well, this evening, what we're going to do is we're going to um, begin a new sermon series. That's the plan. Sermon series in the book of Philippians. Okay, now, you know perhaps what we could do, therefore... We could probably have an introductory sermon, couldn't we, before we get to the text? You've maybe sat through these introductory sermons before. You know, you know what happens, don't you? An introductory sermon where we look at some of the themes of the letter. Joy in Philippians and unity in Philippians. And it'll be an introductory sermon that tells you lots about the city of Philippi as well, won't it? And it, how it's a Roman, or it was a Roman colony up in Macedonia, and it was Complete with emperor worship. But here's the truth. I want to forgo <laughs> the introductory uh, sermon this evening, and I'm keen to hit the ground running and for us to get to the text. And let me explain to you why. If this evening we just take the first couple of verses, what that will enable us to do is not only actually to touch on some of the introductory matters anyway, but it will also help us, if we just look at verses 1 and 2, it will help us to touch on that most topical of issues. In verses 1 and 2, this evening, we see much about how you and I as Christians should view and comprehend our own identity, our identity in Christ, and our identity before God. So that's the plan, to look at the very start of Philippians. So can I encourage you uh, to have your Bibles open? Maybe it's on your phone, and even if you've got a phone out, we're sure you're not on Instagram or anything like that. I'm sure you've got the text there in front of you. If it's on your phone or if it's a physical copy of Scripture, have that uh, open. As we think about, first of all, let's think together, or notice together, rather, our identity as slaves it's the first thing to think about. So our identity, but our identity as slaves. Now, um, I'm sure you're with me when I say this, that one of the most frustrating elements of this present lockdown is our inability to see some of the people that we love, some of our family and friends. Isn't that a frustration, surely, uh, for some, yes, you might say to me, oh, but we can see them on Zoom if we really want to, or we can see them on FaceTime or whatever it might be, but it's not the same. If they live in different parts of the country, then we want to get to them, don't we? We want to see some of our loved ones, and we are unable to, to do that. I want you to appreciate just for a moment, it's kind of like that here in Philippians, because if we just think about the authorship of this letter, so we're thinking about the Apostle Paul, maybe you can see that there might be a little bit of a frustration for the Apostle. Now, understand that this letter, the letter to the Philippians, it is bursting (laughs) with affection. It's burst, it's overflowing with affection. Now, Paul the Apostle clearly, just read it through once, he clearly loves the Philippians. But what's the problem? They can't get to Philippi. Paul can't get to these people. Why not, friends? Why not? It's not because Nicola Sturgeon has told him he's not allowed to get there. It's not because of a five-mile restrictive area. It's not that. Why can Paul not get to Philippi? You know, don't you? 
It's because this man is in chains, isn't he? This is one of Paul's prison epistles, isn't it? That most likely understand that here at this point in time, Paul is in Rome, most likely. So there's mention of Caesar's household, mention of the imperial guard. So he is under house arrest in Rome, and as much as he would like to, he can't get to the Philippians. So what does he do instead? He writes this love letter to this church, okay? So you're with me thus far? We're thinking about authorship, I suppose, and we've got Paul the apostle. Is that it? Have a look at verse one. Nope. We also have mention of Timothy. So what's going on there? Well, recently, uh, Catherine and I, my wife and I, have been writing innumerable cards, birthday cards for family, Thank you cards for so many people who have been kind. All manner of different types of cards. I do not know what it's like in your household. For us, uh, that's a bit of a dual effort. uh, Because maybe I will sit down and I will have the bright idea of writing a card. But I'm not the brightest, sharpest tool in the box. And so I have to shout through to my wife, what do I write? (laughs) And then we have to get our heads together. And we have to try and write it uh, together. Is that how you're understanding this, Paul? And Tim, are you thinking about this perhaps as being co-authorship? Don't think so. Because elsewhere in his other letters, where it does seem to be more of a joint effort, and when Paul mentions maybe a companion, Sylvanus, somebody like that, what you'll find in the letter is a lot more plurals, we see this, we do this, we love, and you, you don't have that in the letter to the Philippians. So actually, I think this is what's going on. So why does Paul mention Timothy? Because Timothy, like Paul, knows these people. Timothy, like Paul, loves these people. So you get the idea. Yes, Timothy's there. Yes, Timothy's maybe acting as a secretary as well. But, but Paul's mentioning because Timothy's invested in these Philippians. And as we'll learn in chapter 2, Timothy is just about to travel to Philippi to see them. Okay, so we've got, what do we have? We've got Paul. We've got Timothy. Actually here, most of all, above all that stuff, I want you to notice how Paul refers to them. So maybe the young people can look at it as well. Let's look at verse 1 for the third time. How does Paul speak about Paul and Timothy? Do you see what he says? Let's look at it, friends. Verse 1, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, or I would prefer you to think about that as Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus. That is very much the way that the original uh, readers, the Philippians, would have understood that word. So it's Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus. Now, (laughs) last year, in my wisdom, um, I was preaching in London, and I preached on slavery Uh, biblical slavery, the biblical view of slavery. And in my wisdom, I managed to time that so that I was preaching on slavery right at the height of the tensions around the Black Lives Matter uh, marches. Now, can can you see why that might be slightly controversial for me to choose right there to a very ethnically diverse congregation in the center of London for, for me, in my wisdom, to decide to choose that point, that's a good point, to speak about slavery. Now, do you see why it's controversial? What happens when we hear slavery is that immediately our minds think about the situation in the United States, the atrocities that were committed in the United States in the 18th, 19th centuries don't we? We put those two things t- together. Now, very often in preaching, what we'll do is we will try to show how this sort of slavery in the first century was very, very, very different to the atrocities that were committed in the United States. 
Now, do, do you see that? There's a, there's a great difference. We'll show that it's, it's it, you know, that will be the emphasis of preaching. It was not a racial thing, slavery, here in the first century. It was not necessarily even a lifelong experience for a person. They could buy themselves out of slavery. So that will be very often the emphasis to show how they're different. Not tonight. Because I am desperate for you to understand what it would be like for a slave in, in Philippi. You know, to be a slave in the first century in Philippi was an awful thing. I mean, do you appreciate that? Do you appreciate that a slave in the first century world really was the lowest of the low, you know, the lowest rung of the ladder, lowest class of person, a slave in the first century world? Wow, you know, they were just a belonging. And that's all it was. You were, you were a possession of your master. You were at the beck and call of your master. And so maybe this evening, if you're joining us tonight, either online and in here, and you are not a Christian, maybe you're absolutely baffled by what Paul does at the beginning of this letter. Because in, in, light, of, <laughs> in light of what it was to be a slave, maybe if you're not a Christian, you should think, well, why on earth would anyone do this? Why would anybody volunteer? refer to themselves as a slave, right? Like, why? I mean, it seems to be a, a badge of honor for the apostle Paul. Why on earth would you do that? Perhaps you're asking that if you're not a Christian, but what every believer in this room would affirm is that actually, spiritually, it makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Because what has happened to us if you're a Christian? What has occurred in your life? You understand, don't you? That it, for us, there has been something of a transfer of ownership. Isn't that what's happened to us in the gospel? And we, we were at one stage under the most tyrannical and vile of masters, under the dominion of sin. We were slaves to sin. And what was that master? That master hated us. That master sin wanted to, to abuse us, mistreat us. What does sin do? Sin lies to us, wants to see us defeated, killed, destroyed. And what has happened in the gospel? 1 Corinthians 6. We have been bought out of it. We have been purchased out of it. And to what? You might say, to freedom in Christ. And yes, but we have been freed to enter the service of the Lord Jesus Christ. Have we not? We have in the gospel actually become the slaves of Jesus Christ. That's what God has done. God has claimed you. God has taken you. God has thrown you into the eternity long service of the most loving and the most merciful, the, the most gracious of all masters, the Lord Christ, the King of kings. But then let's, let me ask you, if you're a Christian, is that really how you're viewing yourself? Even this evening, does that infuse the way that you live? I mean, you know what it's like. Maybe some of the young people, maybe some of the teenagers can recognize it. When we're a teenager, it can all be about getting autonomy, getting independence from mom and independence from dad and getting away. You know, we want to be the captain of our own ship. We want to do that, don't we? Well, if that's you, I've got news for you. As you get older, <laughs> it doesn't change. Does it, friends? We're the same. We want to be autonomous. We want to be absolutely independent. And I have to ask, is that how we're living right now? Is that how you're living? Just pursuing your own desire, pursuing your own will, your own wants. Should it not be this evening that we look to Paul and see his attitude? He embraces the fact his identity is tied up with the service of the king. Do we wake up every morning? Do you wake up every morning and look to your master and seek with all of your heart and all your power to do his will. Our identity is slaves. Now, um, recently, a, a friend of our family uh, took up furniture restoration. 
And with all of these things, I could get the, the details of this wrong and get into a lot of trouble, but I'll try my best. Essentially, what I think uh, this friend of the family has done, what they do, she designs her own fabric, and she has that fabric made. So you can imagine it, intricate, beautiful, bright fabric. She has the fabric made, and then what she does is she takes what is otherwise really dull furniture, you know, the furniture doesn't look like anything particularly, but she takes it, she makes the furniture look nice and, I don't know, sands it down and polishes it and so on. But then what she does is she upholsters it with this new, you know, specially designed, bright and beautiful fabric, upholsters it, redresses this furniture so that it looks beautiful and probably is very expensive uh, at the, the same time. Now, I, I do wonder though, if you recognize that, in essence, that's kind of what Paul is doing at the start of Philippians here, that what he does is he takes what is otherwise really quite boring convention when it comes to letter writing in the ancient world. So in the, the Greco-Roman world, all he did to begin a letter, there was convention, and they just stated author, recipient, and greeting. So pretty pretty dull. But do you notice what Paul does? Here, the beginning of Philippians, he upholsters that. He embroiders that with the bright, beautiful glory of, of gospel truth. He embellishes that convention. Now, if you miss that with the authorship, you'll definitely see it here when we think about the recipients of the letter, the recipients of the letter. And there's kind of two sides to the recipients. So under this heading, let's just think about our identity as saints. You with me, friends? We've seen our identity as slaves. Let's think about our identity as saints. And here, I just want to speak to the, the younger people. So that's the school age people here and at home. And I've just got a question for you. So, sorry if I'm going to put you on the spot, but I'm sure you'll cope. <laughs> um, so, I just want to know if you're of school age, have you heard this expression? Somebody say to you, you're a saint. Fraser, has anybody ever said to you, you're a saint? <laughs> no. But you've heard the expression, maybe you're a saint. Let's think of an example, shall we? Um, maybe sometimes people are given notes to take to other class, classes, to another teacher. Let's imagine you had to do that this week. So your teacher says to you, oh, come on, can you take this note through to your other... Well, we give the teacher an, a name, another name. Take this through to Mrs. Strictness. And we'll take the note through. So you're asked to do that. So you go through to the, across the... And you take the note and then you come back in don't you? You come back in, and what does the teacher do? Imagine she looks at you, thumbs up, thanks very much for that, you're a star, or thanks very much for that, and she says, you're a saint. You're a saint. Do you see the idea? So it's the idea that you've done something great. Oh, well done you. Congrats. Oh, you, you're, the, you're the best. Oh, well, you're, you're a saint. You see the idea? Now, why am I telling you that? Because you need to appreciate, we all need to appreciate, that when Paul is writing to the Philippians, and he says, and calls them saints, we all need to appreciate it is not that meaning at all in any way, shape, or form. Now, that begs a question, doesn't it? Begs the question, well, what, what, what does Paul mean by, by calling these people saints? Well, just for a second, I take you back to the Old Testament and take you back to Exodus 40. You don't need to turn it up. I'm sure you all know it. Off by heart, Exodus 40. Now, what's happening in Exodus 40? The tabernacle, we know what's meant by that, don't we? Where God dwelt in the tent, the tabernacle is being arranged. Let me just paraphrase what God says. God says to his people, you take that lampstand and I want it. You take that basin and I want it in the tabernacle. Do you see? Do you follow what's going on here? Well, God says, 
I am choosing this altar, this basin, this lampstand, and I am choosing it for myself. I am consecrating. You must consecrate this for me. God claiming these items, and what he's doing is giving these things. He's saying, these things must be for my use, nothing else. You must use it for the sole purpose of worshiping me, God, and what he's doing is giving that an elevated, exalted status as holy to the Lord. Now, do you not agree with me that it is an amazing thing to consider that it is that terminology, that very idea that Paul is using here, not to speak about items in a tabernacle, but to speak about people these first century Christians in Philippi. Do you see the idea? Paul is saying that it's not just items in a tabernacle, but it is people, Christians, that are given this elevated status, a set apart for God. Not just set apart to pursue holiness. No, Paul is saying the, these people in Philippi actually set apart to be recognized as holy. This exalted status for people as set apart for God. Now, again, if you're not a professing Christian in the room, again, this might be baffling to you. Indeed, it might even be offensive to you. Now, you think about it. It's not just the Philippians claiming this. It's actually me and the people in this room who are Christians that we can actually stand and say that in God's sight... We are saints. Does that offend you if you're not a Christian? Does it sound arrogant? Well, we are the most wicked of all people. Believe me, there's not a moment where we think we are in any way better than you. But surely you're asking, how is it possible that people like me, people like this here can be recognized as holy? Well, praise God, he gives you the answer. Look with me in verse 1. Now, you notice in verse 1 what Paul does not say in verse 1. Paul does not say to all the saints at Philippi. What does he say? He says to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi. And if you're not a Christian, perhaps you'll go from this room and there'll be maybe some elements of this service that you might meditate upon or think about how I would plead with you to linger on this fact that it is only through Jesus Christ, it is only by Christ, it is only in Jesus Christ that any person is able to claim to be holy in the sight of God. Now, please hear me that as we repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, what happens? <laughs> the Christians in here know so well. What happens? We repent and believe, yeah, all of our sin is dealt with. So all, if you're not a Christian, think about it, all of your guilt and all of the shame and the actual penalty for your sin is dealt with. That is true. What's more, you repent and you, and you believe that the obedience of Jesus Christ becomes your obedience. The holiness of Jesus Christ is reckoned to you Paul says they are saints, yes, but only through his son, God's son. But then to the Christian, I do wonder about you this evening. I wonder if lockdown's been hard for you as a Christian, has it? Has lockdown been tough? The last year, a year of feeling low. Wait a minute. Is it been a case this year that you felt unloved and unwanted. And during the pandemic, relationships breaking down. Has there been for you a crisis in your own self-worth and your self-understanding, the way that you view your identity? How I long for you to see if you're in Christ, there is no need you see it? If you're in Jesus Christ, this exalted status of saints is yours. 
You, in the eyes of the one who counts most, you are loved. You are cherished by God most high. You, in Christ, even with all the baggage and all the stuff you've got going on and all the sin that you're wrestling with, you have this beautiful, exalted status of saint. And it is a status you owe entirely to the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, our identity as slaves, our identity as saints. A third thing, friends, that we've got to notice here is our identity as servants of each other. Okay? Servants of each other. Okay, so do you recognize what we've done here? We've almost kind of played spot the difference a little bit. We've held up Paul's introduction and we've compared it to the letter writing conventions of the day. Okay, and we've seen that there's a number of differences and Paul's is more colorful and elaborate. There's actually something else we can do as well. We can hold up the, the beginning to the letter of Philippians and we can compare it with Paul's introductions to the other letters he writes. Okay, now, you see it's Philippians with all his other epistles. Now, if we were to do that tonight, we would notice there's a number of peculiarities to Philippians, these first intro introductory verses. But I just want us to think about one. Okay, so if you would look with me, please, uh, to the end of verse one. Let's do that. Show the kids and the kids at home, show them the verses as well. So the end of verse one, do you see it? So um, Paul says, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi. And then he says, ah, he says, together with the overseers and deacons. Now, I've not been long in this job, have I? Um, it might seem like I've been here for ages, but I've only been here for about eight or nine days in this job. But I have noticed already that we are a very, very diverse uh, congregation theologically, aren't we? Or we certainly, we come from uh, lots of different backgrounds, don't we? Church backgrounds. So we're not all brought up in the free church. We, we come from different backgrounds. So some Baptist backgrounds, some Anglican backgrounds, some no church going backgrounds, some Pentecostal backgrounds, some charismatic backgrounds, even some, even some Presbyterian backgrounds. Uh, uh, background. So very, very diverse. So because of that diversity, maybe, maybe we do just need to ask or address a couple of questions about that. I mean, the first question is obvious, isn't it? O overseers and deacons, who are they? What's meant by that? Who are these overseers and, and deacons? Right? Well, just take it one at a time. Overseers. <laughs> oh, I can just give that to you. Come on. Guess what an overseer does, okay? An overseer, surprise, surprise, an overseer oversees. Now, the word is a word that's used interchangeably throughout the New Testament with the word for presbyter or for elder. Interestingly, I think I'm right in saying always in the plural, but you see the idea, who's the overseer? It's the elder, it's the person who is uh, tasked with the spiritual oversight of the congregation. Overseer, elder, we, we get it. What's the other one though? Deacon, even, even simpler, I think, because literally it is a servant. Do you see the, the divergence? We've got the spiritual oversight and then the deacon tasked with the the needs, dealing with the needs, the practical concerns of the congregation. And if you know the free church at all, you'd probably be glad to see that our ecclesiology probably is fair to say matches up with this because, and boys and girls, hear it carefully, we at St. Peter's have two offices in the church. We know what they are. They are the office of elder and the office of deacon. Okay? So we know who these overseer deacon, that leads on to the second question, the one that surely you're asking. Why does Paul mention them? He doesn't mention, he doesn't talk about them in other, he doesn't write to, when he's writing to Thessalonians, he doesn't mention the overseers and deacons. 
Why does he mention them? After all, you would expect, wouldn't you, that if he mentions them in the introduction, you would expect that somewhere in Philippians, he's going to give over a portion of the letter to write to them, to speak to them, and he doesn't do that. So why? Well, it's maybe a little bit more straightforward than I'm making out. Later on in the letter, Paul's going to talk about a gift, a present, financial gift that the Philippians had given to him. So can you see what's going on here? Now, Paul mentions the overseers and deacons to acknowledge the role that surely they had, the church leaders had, in encouraging that congregation to give and to give sacrificially to Paul. Now, in all fairness, Sunday night, and you might be looking at me thinking, oh, come on, man. You know, it's, you know the, the details of the overseers and deacons. You might be thinking, oh, there's lots to do on a Sunday night. This is dull. This is technical. But I want you to appreciate that there is a tiny little phrase here that as a congregation at St. Peter's, we should embrace. And I think, honestly, to be frank with you, I think it should challenge us. But to notice the phrase, what I'll do is I will read the end of verse one, and you good people will just tell me if I'm reading it correctly. So look at the end of verse one, you just tell me if I'm reading this correctly, okay? Boys and girls, look at the end of verse one, let's get this. So, have I got this right? Let me read it. To all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, under the control of the overseers and deacons. Did I read that correctly? Let me, I'm not very good at reading. Let me try again. To all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, in rebellion against the overseers and deacons. No, no, a third try. Okay, let's get it this time. To all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons. Now, you might think I'm just being daft, right? You might think I'm being silly. But there's an important point there, isn't there? Like today, we, we genuinely live at a time where there are so many tensions and abuses when it comes to church leadership, aren't there? And it's something that's hitting the headlines all the time. So on, on, on one hand, we have church leaders, and it's so common, isn't it? Church leaders who seek to dominate and seek to control and abuse and manipulate their fellow leaders or especially the vulnerable in their congregations. And on the other hand, what do we have? We have church members who are equally vile to those in church offices, church members who, who, who fail to recognize the responsibility that church leaders have. And so simply, I'm asking you tonight, when you look at that idea together with, together with, does that sound like your relationship with these people in the room? Does it sound like your relationship with your brothers and sisters in Christ at St. Peter's? Whether you are in office in the church, whether you are an, a deacon, an overseer, or whether you are a church member, how do you think of your identity? Surely it must be first and foremost that you are part of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. First and foremost, you are part of the body of Jesus Christ, we must pray through whether or not we are in here together with, together with the saints. And then we'll close with us. So we've seen what? Um, We've seen our identity as slaves, our identity as saints, our identity as servants of each other. Last thing, last thing. We see our identity as those who are saved. Those who are saved. And at last, can you believe it? We get to verse 2. We get to verse 2 and this greeting and this salutation. 
And uh, yeah, maybe it is worth noting that in the Greco-Roman world, uh, the letter, the greeting, would just be one word, one word. So you would have, if you're writing a letter in, in, in Philippi, normally it would be one word, author, one word, recipient, and then just the word greetings. And it is interesting to see Paul doesn't do that. You know, Paul embroiders it, he embellishes it, he puts gospel, truth, and that's fine. But I do want you to look at the beginning of the greeting. So look at the beginning of verse 2, and is it fair to say that you look and see, staring back at you, a couple of very, very familiar terms? Is that true? So you look at the beginning of verse 2, a couple of very familiar terms, grace and peace. Now, this is what I want to point out to you. I want to point out something that has, oh, it's a terrible admission, uh, but it has passed me by for years, and it's actually very, very important. So I wonder what translation you've got. We've probably, because of lockdown and we're all bringing our Bibles and our phones, we've probably got all manner of different translations of Scripture in front of us. And I wonder what it says. If you have a look in your own Bible, what does it say? So some will have this. Some will have it rendered as grace and peace to you. I wonder if you've got that in front of you. Grace and peace eh, to you. Here's the thing about that. Uh, Paul doesn't write that. And as far as I'm aware, and I think I've got this right, Paul never writes that at the beginning of his letters. Now, see if you can spot the difference, okay? So instead of Paul writing grace and peace, grace and peace to you, Paul actually writes this, grace to you and peace. Now, you might very well think that I am splitting hairs. <laughs> but if you linger on it for a moment, you'll begin to see the importance. Do you not begin to see what Paul is doing? So what Paul is doing is first they are speaking of God's action towards his people. The initiative that God has taken, this great fully orbed work of redemption of his church, he's speaking about grace, God's grace, before secondarily, what does Paul do? He goes on to speak about the consequence of that. See, God's work in us, grace, but then the results of that, peace. And if you're a Christian in the room or at a home, doesn't your heart sing when you linger on that reality? Because again, just take the one at a time. Grace, what's God done for you? Entirely unprovoked by you. <laughs> Entirely uninspired by you. God has decreed from all time to lavish divine favor on you. Isn't that amazing? Like unmerited by you, entirely and completely undeserved by you. God has chosen you from out of the crowd, from out of the pack. He's chosen you to, to pour love on you. What sort of favor is it? It's a, an abounding, lavish favor, isn't it? What does Paul say elsewhere? Where sin abounds, grace abounds, all the more. It's lavish love for you that God has, and more it is eternal, eternal. And we think about it, and we praise God. But then, wait, what's the consequence, friends? Like, what is the result of that? You might say, yes, we have, you know, good relationships with people. Much, much more than that. This evening, as you sit in this place, you sit at home, if you're in Christ, you have shalom. You have this wholeness with God Almighty. You were at war with God how terrifying. What a prospect. We were at war at enmity with God. But in the gospel, as he showers us in grace, we now stand knowing peace, perfect, perfect peace with God. If you're a Christian, that has to infuse 
your identity. That has to come and impact tonight and forevermore how you view yourself. You battling with a lack of self-worth, struggling with your self-understanding, your identity. You are someone who's seen grace in your life. You are at peace and peace with God. And I end with one question to those who are outside of Jesus Christ, for those who are not Christians, one question. Ready? Did you notice the repetition? If you're not a Christian, did you notice the threefold repetition? If you look down at Scripture, you'll see it. Look at the beginning. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus. Where does this, this amazing saving grace come from? From God the Father. And yep, there you go. You got it again. The Lord Jesus Christ. Friend, I pray, I long that if you're not a Christian, you see there in whom your identity must be found. Friend, if you bow to Jesus Christ tonight, if you recognize your sin, you repent of your sin, you go to Christ by faith for forgiveness, listen to this. What was announced by the angels at Jesus' birth? What was promised to the 12 just before Jesus' death? What was proclaimed to the disciples just after Jesus' resurrection? If you come to Jesus Christ tonight, that will this evening be yours. If you bow to him, if you confess and believe tonight, you will know peace, peace, peace with the almighty, eternal judge, our God and all through his astounding, his bountiful, his amazing grace. Friends, let's bow our heads and pray.